choir. Thank you, Tom. Amen. You're not going to record this? Huh? Oh, you're waiting for them. Okay. All right. I thought maybe my, 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 I thought maybe he was thinking, no, I'm not going to record this today. I, I, I got tears in my eyes, but I can still, per, I can still preach. Amen. All right. Hey, listen, this is the last sermon in the book of Joshua. And uh, we've done, we've done 10 weeks on the book of Joshua. And we ended up last week in the 10th chapter of uh, the book of Joshua and the rest of the story. Let me tell you what happens in the rest of the book because you're thinking, you know, there's 24 chapters in the book of Joshua and he's going to preach all 24 of them today. I'm not. But in chapters 10 through 12, there's a southern campaign, a northern campaign and the defeat of 31 kings. It's all about the battles in the northern and southern section of the land of Canaan. And then when you get to chapters 13 to 21, it's the division of the land. Nation after tribe after tribe after tribe, they get their land in the promised land. And then whenever you get to chapter 20, 22, the tribes for uh, the four, the tribes <laughs> beyond the Jordan return to their land. And then in Joshua chapter 23, Joshua gives his farewell address and he makes four declarations. God has been fighting for you. God will drive out these nations and you will possess the land. If you go back and cling to these nations, they will ensnare you. And not one promise of God has failed. Joshua 24 is where Joshua ends this book. And he ends the book in the same place I want to end this sermon series with a choice. So Joshua chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. Let's go back through and again, and let me remind you, and I promise you, after I finish the Joshua series, we will not do this again. But one more time, I want to remind you what we've been doing. God is moving us, say it with me, God is moving us from the land of not enough, through the land of just enough, into the land of more than enough. And remember, the land of more than enough is a land of victory and triumph. It's a land of blessing and vision. It's a land of intimate relationship with God and the revelation of God. What God wants, wanted for the nation of Israel, He wants for us. He wants us to experience that kind of life. He wants us to experience not battles where we pull out weaponry and we fight things. We're in a spiritual battle, but God wants us to experience victory. You don't experience spiritual victory without having an enemy. And you have enemies. And we looked at those enemies, seven enemies of the land of more than enough. But here in Joshua chapter 24, we have a choice that is presented to us. So let me read Joshua 24, verses 1 through 15. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for the heads and their judges and their officers and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led them through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst, and afterwards I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. And they fought with you and I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam. So he had to bless you. And I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, 
and the Hittite and the Girgashite, the Hivite and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This story is about Joshua and the nation of Israel, but it's really also a story about us. Amen. It is a choice being presented to us. Life is filled with choices. We choose who our friends will be. We choose our mate. We choose where we'll go to college or trade school. We choose our occupation. We choose a career. We make choices and our choices make us. God has presented in this passage a choice. He's asking us to choose. He's asking us what choice. Joshua 24, 15. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. That word serve is the Hebrew word abad. It's used 290 times in the Hebrew Bible. Most of the time it means serve, but it also means work or slave or worship. He's describing a lifestyle committed to God. More than just saying, okay, I'm for God. It is a life of service and work and worship of the one true God. He's presented a choice. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Are you going to choose to be on the Lord's side or will you choose some other pathway? This choice that God has presented before us is life's greatest choice. And there are four aspects to life's greatest choice. First, life's greatest choice is an inescapable choice. Joshua, in this passage, the word choose is an imperative. It's a command. He's saying, he's ordering them. He's saying, choose. It's not an option. It's an inescapable choice. He's issuing a directive, an official military command. Choose for yourselves this day. He's the commander of the Israeli military, and he's issuing a command. Choose. Life's greatest choice is an inescapable choice. You know, the Bible has many occasions in which a choice is offered. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the law and he found the children of Israel with a golden calf and worshiping around it, practicing idolatry, Moses said to them, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. He wanted them to make a choice. And when you come to the end of Moses' life in Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20, Moses presents another choice. Look with me at Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you're entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse so choose life in order that you may live you and your descendants by the loving the Lord your God by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him for this is your life and the length of your days 
that you may live in the land which the Lord your God swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Choose life, he says. He gives them this, this great choice, and he says, you can choose life or you can choose death. He doesn't give them another choice. He makes it simple. There are only two different options. You choose God or you choose everything else. You choose to be on the Lord's side or you choose on the other side, and the other side is destruction. Jesus, we see this in the life of Jesus. When Jesus was standing before Pilate, do you remember what happened at that sort of a mock trial? Pilate says to the people, because it was the time of the year when they would give away one of the prisoners, and they said, whom would you have me give away, Pilate says? Barabbas, a known criminal, or Jesus, the one who is called Christ? Jesus, the sinless, perfect Lamb of God. Whom will you choose? And they said, give us Barabbas. And then Pilate said to them, what will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? It's a great question. What will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And the multitude answered, crucify him. You know, I... I'm fascinated by the fact that on Sunday, just five days before, they're shouting, Hosanna, Amen. blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This great multitude, Hosanna, waving palm fronds, throwing down their garments so they can walk on them, uh, uh, riding on a donkey into the city. Hosanna, he saves. And then here we are, crucify him. They're shouting. They made their choice. You know, some choices don't leave us with a third option. You can't be both a criminal and a law-abiding citizen. You can't be both married and single at the same time. You can't be for God and against God at the same time. You have to choose. There's no middle ground. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You have to choose. Jesus describes the choice with two ways and two gates. He says there's a broad way that leads to destruction and a wide gate, and many that find that way. And then he describes a, a narrow way and a small gate that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. I know I've always pictured that wide and narrow gate as this simple pathway where you come and you're confronted by a, a wide gate and a narrow gate right next to each other and you can make a choice between the two. But Jesus describes the wide gate as many people going that way and the narrow gate hard to find. And in my mind, I have a different idea. If you've ever been to a place where there's a great gathering of people, maybe a stadium or something, and they're all coming towards you and, and you're trying to go around them. Maybe you're trying to get to the restroom or something and you're going against the flow. You're, everybody's coming this way, but you have to go against the flow. You have to weave your way through that group of people and it's hard to find the pathway because everybody's coming against you. And that's the way it is in the world. The whole world is going that way and, and Jesus is telling us, no, don't go that way. That's where the destruction path is. Go the narrow way. You'll have to go against the grain. It's like what happens with a fish. A fish that dies will go downstream. Only a living fish can swim upstream. You have to be alive to make this choice. It's an inescapable choice. And what will you do with Jesus? Life's greatest choice is not just an inescapable choice, it's an intelligent choice. Joshua did not ask the nation of Israel to choose blindly. He reminded them of the blessings and provision, the victory and triumph. He reminded them of all the great victories they experienced. He reminded them that they'd gone off into Egypt and they had been rescued from Egypt by the mighty hand of God. Pharaoh was defeated. He reminded them that they'd walked across the Red Sea on dry land. He reminded them that the Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea. He reminded them that they went into Jericho and they defeated Jericho, a, a mightier city than they'd ever encountered. He reminded them that he had had great victory in the land of more than enough, that enemy after enemy he, they had faced and they had been victorious because God was fighting for them. 
He reminded them how good God was and how much God had protected them and provided for them. It was an intelligent choice. He reminded them that they lived in cities and, and houses that they had not built. He reminded them that they ate from vineyards and olive trees that they had not planted. God had blessed them. God had blessed them. It's an intelligent choice. Accepting Jesus as Savior and following Him as Lord is a personal, decisive act. It's a decision of both the heart and the mind. Not, not the beating heart that pumps blood in the middle of your body, but that part of you where emotional, relational, volitional decisions are made. It is an intelligent choice. When I was in Idaho, I had a friend of mine who had told me about how his conversion experience initiated. He had been raised by a very intellectual mom and dad. They were both school professors, college teachers. They were agnostics, and he was raised to be an agnostic. And he was very proud. His family was very proud of their agnostic beliefs. But he didn't talk about it to anyone because he was surrounded by a bunch of people who were Christians. And one day, one of those Christians said, hey, you've got to come to this Christian retreat we're having in Sun Valley, Idaho. We're going to go skiing, and we're going to have these great worship experiences. He says, man, we went last year, and the Spirit really moved. You've got to come. He didn't want to tell the guy that he was an agnostic. He didn't want to be embarrassed. He had no idea what it meant that the Spirit moves. So he decided to go. And the first evening, his friend said, you've got to come to the worship. We're going to have a great worship. The Spirit of God's going to really move. So he says, oh, I'm not really feeling well. I think I'll stay up here, kind of in the, in the area where they're at the sleeping compartment. Everybody went down to worship, and uh, he creeps down the stairs about halfway through when he could hear them singing. He looks around the corner, and he sees people with their eyes closed and their hands raised. And he says, I don't see any furniture moving around, so I don't know what they mean by spirit moving. Anyway, so the next day they go out to go skiing and he's in the big break area and he says, I don't want to go out and go skiing. It's too cold out there. So he sees a couch and beside the couch an end table and on the end table a Bible. He's never in his life been to church, never heard the gospel, never read the Bible, never opened a Bible in his entire life. So he goes and sits down on this couch. He's afraid that someone might see him if he has the Bible and might ask him a question from it because he has no clue. He's never opened one. So he sits down and he looks around, makes sure nobody's around. He grabs the Bible and he puts it on his lap. Now, I don't recommend you do this. And he said, God, if you're really up there, I want you to say something to me out of this Bible. I'm going to open up the Bible and I'm going to put my finger on one verse and I'm only going to read one verse. And it can't be something I have to interpret. It can't be something for somebody else. It has to be for me. And I'm only going to do this one time. He opens his Bible. He puts his finger on a verse, he looks at the verse, and it says, the fool has said in your heart, there is no God. <laughs> he looks up the seal and he says, I bet you think that's pretty funny. <laughs> the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There's a lot of truth to that. You see, this choice that we make is an intelligent choice. There's a great truth in that verse the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There's plenty of evidence. Romans 1, 18 through 20, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident to them. He's talking about the conscience. That God has made himself evident in the conscience of every single human being. They are without excuse who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. He goes on to say, For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so they are without excuse. God made himself known both in the conscience of man and in the revelation of his creation. Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens are telling the glory of God. See, I believe that God has shown us not just in the Bible, 
the truth of God and in our conscience, but he's also revealed himself in nature. When we look at the heavens, we see the handiwork of God. Did you know up until 1931, scientists universally believed that the universe was eternal and in a, set, a steady state, that it is what has always existed and it's always been the same. But in 1931, mounting evidence began to demonstrate that indeed the universe had a beginning and they called it the Big Bang. The startling thing is that this isn't surprising to those of us who read the Bible. This is Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you, know, do you know scientists thought Christians were crazy with that one line, in the beginning? There's no beginning. It's always been this way, the scientists believe. But the Big Bang, of course, demonstrates in the science is, is, is very strong that we have a universe that had a beginning. And it's in our text, we see that it's true. You know, astronomer Robert Jastro, he wrote in his book, God and the Astronomers. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. See, this is an intelligent decision. You don't have to drop your brains at the door to become a Christian. Scientists tell us that this Big Bang is not a chaotic explosion like a dynamite going off. It is a finely tuned expansion event. And that expansion event is still going on. The psalmist said, God stretches out the heavens. Until they began to see this with the Doppler shift, they had no idea that the universe is stretching out even today. God is still allowing that original finely tuned expansion event to continue. And God is the one who made it all. This universe that we live in has all the marks of an intelligent designer. You know, the earth spins on its axis 1,000 miles an hour. 1, 000, are you getting dizzy? 1,000 miles an hour. And, and that, that takes 24 hours, that revolution. It's tilted. By the way, if it spun any slower, we would slow cook. If it spun any faster, we would freeze. It's tilted on a 23.5 degree angle that gives us the seasons. If it was straight up and down, there would be some latitudes that would have continuous winter and some latitudes that would have a continuous summer. But it's tilted so that we get to have fall and spring and summer and winter. We would not have seed time and harvest if we did not have those seasons. Tilting, this, tilting the earth just three or four degrees either way would completely eliminate our seasons in most sections of the whole planet. It is precisely tilted, exactly the way it has to be tilted. The, the earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour, but it's going around the sun at 66,600 miles per hour. It takes us 365 and a fourth days to get all the way around the sun. The sun is 93 million miles away. And think about this. It takes us 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. It takes Pluto 248 years to go around the sun. Boy, that's a long winter. Amen? 248 years to go around. That's one year. Those people... They live and die. Nobody's living on Pluto, but if they lived there, they would live and die before they ever have the first year. 248 years all the way around. 66,600 miles per hour. We're traveling and orbiting in our galaxy at 648,000 miles per hour. We're moving in a north direction. In other words, north in terms of the, the polar Arctic cap. We're moving 43,200 miles per hour in the northern direction, but we're rotating inside the Milky Way at 648,000 miles an hour. There's 300 billion stars in just our Milky Way, but in the entire universe, it's estimated that there are 200 billion trillion stars. That's 200 with 21 zeros behind it. Nine more zeros than our national debt. 
It is an amazing, huge, huge, massive universe. Listen, you do not have to drop your brains at the door to be a Christian. You just have to believe that God created it all in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. This doesn't startle us. It startles scientists because they've always heard that it was just this way always. And suddenly they go and see the heavens and they say, wait a minute, there's a beginning. Just look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a, what a wonderful, startling, startling reality that life's greatest choice is an intelligent choice. Life's greatest choice is not only an inescapable choice and an intelligent choice. Life's greatest choice is an individual choice. Notice Joshua says, choose for yourselves whom you will serve. Joshua was the commander of the Israeli army. He could have commanded each of his members to choose, but he didn't. He gave each of them a choice. This is an individual choice. He couldn't pass legislation and make everybody choose. It's been tried before. Sometimes it's happened in Christianity's history. Constantine tried to baptize the entire Roman Empire in Christianity. You can't force someone to this choice. It's an individual choice. He was the father of his own household, but each member of his household had to choose. The prophet Ezekiel quoted a proverb that was often used in, in Israel. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. It's a description of the fact that sometimes fathers do something and their sins end up having an impact on the life of their children. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and their children are the ones whose teeth are set on edge. But in this passage that Ezekiel is speaking about this, God holds each person individual. He says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. Listen to this. The soul that sins, it shall die. God forever fixed individual responsibility on each and every one of us. We have an individual responsibility to make this choice for ourselves. When I was seven years old, my father had been sent away to Vietnam during the Tet Offensive, 1968. I remember my dad had been a pastor, but because he was bivocational, he also served in the military. When he went away to Vietnam, we attended West Phoenix Baptist Church. Brother Milton Scott was the pastor. It was September of 1968. We had been watching on the news all of those death counts, the body counts. Some of you are old enough to remember Vietnam, and they would, every day they would talk about how many people were dying and we were seeing those, those caskets and body bags come back from Vietnam. It was a terrible time and of course we were in great fear for our father's life. But during that time, on a Sunday morning, the pastor was preaching a message. And I don't remember the content of his sermon, but I remember there was something about making a decision for Christ. And my initial thought was, it's okay, my dad's a pastor, my dad's a preacher, my dad will get me in. My dad will get me into heaven. He'll take care of it. I was seven years old, so you can imagine a, a seven-year-old kid having a thought like that. But suddenly the preacher said something. I don't know what he said, but I suddenly realized my dad might not be coming back from Vietnam. My dad might die in Vietnam. And even if my dad does come back, my dad can't get me into heaven. Only Jesus can get me into heaven. And that day I walked down the aisle in a Baptist church Southern Baptist Church, West Phoenix Baptist Church, I took the preacher by the hand and I said, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus. I wanted to make life's greatest choice. It's an, it is an individual choice. Mothers would love for their children, love to be able to make this decision for their children. Grandmothers and grandfathers would love, wouldn't you love to be able to make this decision for your children and your grandchildren? We would love to do that, but it's an individual choice. It's not a choice that can be made for some. Wives can't make this decision for their husbands. Husbands can't make this decision for their wife. Life's greatest choice is an individual choice. It's a choice each and, one of, each and every one of us have to make for ourselves. Revelation 3.20, Jesus is standing knocking at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will open the door and I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And it, it's, it's in the 
It's in the context of the Laodicean church that had become so lukewarm that Jesus is outside knocking to get his way in. But the only way Jesus comes into the church is through the lives of individual Christians. That's how he comes in. There's a great picture, a famous painting, where Jesus is standing at a door and he's got a light in his hand and he's knocking. Maybe you've seen that picture. But if you look closely at that painting, there's no knob on the outside of the door. It portrays the, the, the painter had in mind that this is a door that can only be opened from the inside. Amen. Jesus is knocking at the heart's door saying, won't you let me come in? That song we sang, the Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why won't you let him come in? It's an individual choice. The greatest, life's greatest choice is an inescapable choice. It is a... It is an individual choice. It is an intelligent choice. But it is also an immediate choice. Joshua says, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. The emphasis on the Bible, on salvation, is always immediate. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The writer of Hebrews repeats this phrase in 3.15 and 4.7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The writer of Proverbs says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. There's a sense of immediacy in this choice. All the passages in the Bible that talk about life, Describe it as fleeting and uncertain. James writes, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. Job says, my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. The psalmist says, our life is like a dream. If you dream much, you know, Sometimes it seems like the dream lasts all night long. But scientists tell us those dreams really only last a few seconds. Life is short. And this is an immediate choice. You can't help but think about George Bess. When he went in the hospital in Sintera Heart about three weeks ago, I went to visit him. And... I remember on the way in, I said, Lord, I need this guy. I, I, I need you to heal this guy. I still need this guy. But when I went in the hospital that night, I saw him laying up in the hospital. You guys know George. You can't keep that guy down. He mowed the, he mowed the grass at his house this past Wednesday. You know, you can't keep this guy down. But he, in the hospital, he looked very weak. And I asked him, I said, George, tell me about your salvation experience. And he walked me through his decision for Christ. He described where he was, what he was thinking, how he asked Jesus Christ to come in his heart and life. And that gives me great comfort, knowing I'd, I'd hate to, have someone that I know just died and not know where they are for sure. This is an immediate choice. You never know. I mean, would any of you all, I got a call last night, seven o'clock at night. Would any of you all thought George was going to die last night? You think George thought he was going to die last night? You never know how many days you have. You never know how long you'll live. Oh, listen, if you haven't made this decision, this is a decision that is immediate. Life's greatest choice is an immediate choice. The call of God is to serve Him now, not wait until some later on time that you may not have. It's an inescapable choice. You have to choose. You don't get a third option. It's either... You choose Christ or you choose anything else, but nothing else matters. It's all destruction. 
It's, it, is, it is absolutely an intelligent choice. We know God has revealed Himself in His heart. I guarantee you, I've talked to people that say that they are agnostics and I've looked in them in the eye and I say, are you sure that there is no God? And, they, and I have never seen a one. In fact, whenever I meet an atheist, I always ask them, uh, are you sure there's no God? And they say, well... I said, okay, maybe you're an agnostic. Maybe you're not, you don't know for sure. But do you really not know for sure? I, I confess to you, I have never met a single person that I think is a real atheist or an agnostic. And that's what I've told them down through the years as a chaplain. I say, you don't believe in God? I don't believe in atheists. I don't believe there's any such thing. I believe it's just a matter of you haven't made this choice yet. Will you choose? This is an individual choice. It's an immediate choice. Joshua says, I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I hope that's your commitment. Not, not just, some of you need to make a decision to serve Him now. Maybe you made a decision and you said, you know, I, I accepted Him way back when. I'm a Christian. Uh, and then you've moved on with your life. Maybe lots of stuff has gotten in the way since then. And you're at a point now where you say, are you serving Him now? Do you have an active serving life with Him? That's really what this question is about. It's more than just making Him your Savior. It's also about letting Him be the Lord and Master of your life. This is a choice today for you. Don't worry about what everybody else thinks about your choices. Amen. It's your choice. This is your choice. You get to choose. You could face death tomorrow. You want to face death tomorrow without being sure? Make that decision today. We're going to sing. We sang that song. I'm glad Tom had us sing The Savior is Waiting like three times already. Y'all know it by heart now. Would you stand with me? And let me pray. Father, I know... I know there are those who are here in this service today that have never made this decision. God, I pray that today would be the day of decision for them. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. God, I pray you do that work today in somebody's heart. Knock on their door. Oh God, move them by your spirit to choose you. Let your name be on their lips to call upon that they might find in you the Savior and Lord, that, that they can live and love and serve the life that we live. It's, it's not empty. It's not meaningless. It's, it's intelligent. It's, it's wise. It is good. God, let it be a, a holy day today. Let someone come to Christ today. Let someone give their heart and life to you. Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I haven't laid it out real clear today about what you do, but salvation is about putting your faith and trust in Jesus.